Sorry, so back to Zorps again. Oh, this way, we just saw Zorps 2.9.27 was released and added support for Cisco fabric path decoding and encoding. Also, um, there was an issue resolved in the normalization pre product so Zorps had an issue with packet resizing, and that has been fixed. Moving along, uh, this is a really interesting thread on uh, information security state exchange group. Um, the guy was asking about evading IDS in exploit development. And um, he pointed out, based on his research, two things that can be done to evade intrusion detection systems, and they're susceptible to many of them. Uh, mostly being, uh, the main one, oh, they should say, both rely on compression. But uh, according to him, and I believe this is true, uh, is that you see, I guess I grow in uh, Snow or Sonicata, only look at the first or last compression scheme. So if you compress multiple times, you only get the first or last decompressed. And that data will then be decompressed in your spiritual one and then match the payload. So then there's something interesting. Uh, so keep in mind, also need to read, uh, you can check out the links for more and uh, more detailed information on those items. So I'd recommend checking that out. Also, Wireshark 1.99.4 was released, and it's mostly a developmental release. And uh, 2.9.72 in this note has already been prepackaged and available in Security Onion, so you can do Act Dash Get Install, and you'll have that. Also, um, Security Onion, so this is a big move for them, is that they moved all their stuff, the scripts, to GitHub. So now it should be easier to contribute. I actually got a message from Doug the other day about some patches that I need to get. Um, uh, make full fixes, make a full request to it a pretty long time ago. So we can see have a repository for each of the each of the packages. So um, do you check that out. We go on to conference board. Uh, this other conference is coming up. Um, B Side Chicago is May 16th. Uh, ThoughtCon is also in Chicago and that same weekend. And uh, Shane's going to uh, ThoughtCon, is that correct? Yes, I think Wayland's going with me, right? Cool. Yeah. Some of our uh, sometime numbers, like Whitney is giving us out there. Oh, Whitney's giving us out there. She's been here in a while, but she's been here before. Great. Yeah, I'm uh, watching all you guys tonight, too, but that's Pam Benchon again, and my heart relies on the Pam Benchon. So I hope they'll find some cool stuff and bring it back. Thank you. But I think this is Thursday and Friday, though. Is that the same time as Pam Benchon? Oh, it's Thursday and Friday? Doug Con is Thursday and Friday. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll be kind of sorry. The 15th would be. Okay. Yeah, so that's actually, I guess I could make it to Doug Con if I wanted to. Things are still available. But, uh, but, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's too, too, too much, too much in the single weekend. I actually have to go after a hand to come right back to Indiana for a wedding, and then I have something else to do uh, around that time as well, for a full travel ago. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> Brocon is coming up in August. It will be hosted at MIT. So it's uh, quite a ways, but um, I shall be here, I expect. So if you're interested in Bro, I highly recommend the official Bro conference. Also, um, all, Waylon and I will be at AIDD and held at Marshall University in West Virginia. It's the Appalachian Institute for Digital Evidence Conference. They will be giving you a I'll be giving you a talk on ILIC. Uh, I think the software with them will be as well. Um, we're co authoring a talk and uh, this is about the, uh, the training environment for uh, Linux. Based on the uh, containers and using NSM digital forensic tools. So that's kind of cool. Um, also, I'm going to run into tool tray here. Um, so, this is a new plugin that was written for Bro. And essentially, so um, whenever you're working with Bro, typically you, you would do, uh, a lot of people will use Root to do the exchange so that you can just uh, have an access between your nodes to start to start the shop and well. That's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to use Perl processing capabilities so you can actually divide up the specific access control for specific things, such as in this case, we need to net and then net raw to start up the interface and have uh, Bro be able to bind to the interface and sniff, and sniff for traffic. So that's kind of where the Pro control, or excuse me, he wrote, yeah, he wrote, he wrote a Pro control plugin that actually does the best cap stuff for you automatically and it gives you uh, cap net raw and cap net admin. Uh, permissions on the row binary. But it just makes it the same time. Requires that you have to go log in each node and put it on the binary. But this with this, you just pass in the plugin and prior to our when it really execute our row controls ran, it lets you make sure that that is applied to the binary. So that's kind of nice. Uh, also I thought came across this mouse on tool. 
Um, this is a Malamar communication panel. I said I can't play with yet. Um, but essentially, it's a way to visually represent uh, network connections and associated with malware. So you can see they get into examples that uh, DNC stuff peer to peer, fast off DNS. It gives you a nice and pretty uh, graphical view of nodes and the communication between them on the network. So that's kind of cool. We'll hopefully get a better that in the future as well. John Tesh is saying that it is sound like Mongol. So, so does anybody else have any problems? Thank you. Okay, so um, this is the first time we've had audio problems like this. I guess that's something good. We try turning it off and using it like that. The whole thing. I just I don't want to kick the way off if I want to. I don't like that idea. Something more of a quality to it. What could that be? Well, I had everything to use on my system. Are you using your mic on your Mac? No, that was the issue. Well, this one said it was better. I turned, I turned that off. I didn't know that I had going. Um, I think I'm going check, though. Can you move closer to a mic? Well, we're going through this. I believe it has to do with this, with the actual computer problem system. Um, I figured out how to stop being that. I can try to my computer for that. Can you guys hear me now? I don't know. Um, test, test. The linear loud is better. Really? That's the castle in it, but the output is not our really so. Okay? All right, well, I can, I can talk a lot higher. Do I need to? Do you need that in the back door real quick? Is there anything that's completely missed? Hey, John, this is Matt. I just want to confirm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Matt. All right, cool. Um, the only thing I'd say is, is uh, okay, all right, I got, I got Matt is clear, which, all right, sorry for loud and clear. All right, everyone, got you. Um, the only thing I'd say is go back to, <laughs> thanks, Zach, uh, go back to the, um, the thing you were just talking about, uh, you were just going over. The mail column? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's try that. So let's go back to here. So um, again, we talked about the remote control sense map plugin, where um, you can actually uh, have the capability of fit on the bro binary through the remote control plugins, but we started to grow with the file automatically, which saves you a lot of time, and if you had to do it manually. Uh, the other tool that we have um, today on the tool tray is uh, the tool called Malcolm. It's a malware communication analyzer that. Um, Essentially, look at CNC data, task uh, force DNS, some kind of stuff, and give you a line map almost, or an peer-to-peer -peer map between all the hosts and when they were talking to each other and whatnot. So that's actually a cool visual representation of machines you have on your network, and you can use to correlate specific attacks. So and actually do investigations of how, where different pieces of malware connect to and connect from. So that that's um, a tool that we would like to explore in the future. Let me check that out. And this is the uh, GitHub address right here. Uh, next section, we're going to go into uh, ENVDB, and is Nuffield on the call? 
That's what he's going to drop in um, to talk about the tool that he um, he's working on now. It's a, it's a brand new tool, and um, it is essentially a, looks me um, a front end to OS query. So Facebook is working on this tool called OS Query, which allows you to query system data across all of your all of your computers and return them to a central server. And then this tool allows you to make the query and then actually have it in a graphical form so you don't have to use the command line tools. And um, you can see here, you can select everything from processes. So this will grab all the processes running on all the hosts that they have. You can see the Yeti has, you can actually put on specific ones, you don't have to kind of through them themselves in this place. But that's kind of uh, quite interesting. Um, so do check that out. We do plan on doing more, from, uh, more investigations into OS query in the future. All right, and now, um, given that Max and Brian seem to have uh, no audio troubles over there, we're going to go ahead and pass it to them to give their talk today uh, called Elastic NSM using the ELF stack. Uh, so, uh, brief introduction um, Max is all coming with uh, 505 Forensics as, an, uh, as a consultant who works in digital forensics and is the response. He's working uh, basically with network stream volume deployments for a large number of uh, Signs of businesses, including this one, which is actually you know, quite impressive, 175,000 points of employees. So, I'll props to you on that, Matt. <laughs> and uh, Brian Mark also works with Matt, and he has been an engineer at the Security here at the Department of Defense, or a contractor, I should say, also working in similar areas with incident response, intrusion detection, and digital forensics. So, I'm going to go ahead and talk about you guys. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop my screen. And then one of you can pick up by clicking on share screen. Great. Okay, Matt, I'll go ahead and show my screen. And um, so, yeah, my, my name is Brian Marks. Hi, uh, see my, my, my screen that I'm sharing out. See that already? Yeah, Brian, we can see you. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so I work with Matt Bromley. Uh, I'm in the San Francisco office. Uh, he, he's in Dallas. And uh, so I may be in San Francisco if I travel all over. I'm on the East Coast right now. Um, now, why don't you go ahead and give us an intro to Elasticsearch? And yeah, yeah. So, no. First and foremost, thanks, uh, thanks, John, and, and the Open and the group for having us on here. Um, I, I got to be honest. I started hearing about your group. John, I think we've been in contact for a couple months now. But uh, as soon as I started hearing, I was like, I want to get on here. I want to help share and 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 spread the knowledge, spread the word. Um, so. Uh, as, as the introductions went over, Brian and I have been doing this for a little bit now. Our, our experience ranges from, from incident response to, to data breaches and all that kind of stuff. Um, but probably one of the more exciting projects that at least I've ever done, and I'm sure Brian's going to agree with me, has been deploying um, network security monitoring tools. And um, there's a lot of great products out there. I don't need to tell this group. Uh, it just so happens that in a lot of our work, we keep stumbling on Elasticsearch. Um, and we keep utilizing this as a tool. Now, uh, it's, it's a little bit out of this scope, but we've actually uh, ported Elasticsearch into uses for digital forensics, incident response, large-scale log analysis. Um, and for this purpose, we're going to be talking about something that we've dubbed Elastic NSM, which um, is really using Elasticsearch for the purpose of, of network security monitoring. So monitoring network data, um, interacting with, uh, with data of that sort, um, and and really kind of using the the power of the GUI front end and the indexing and the visualizations to to help drive investigations to help you know find out knowledge faster. Um, so uh, there's a lot of kind of terms been thrown around. The biggest one is the Elk stack. Um, the Elk stack is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, and all of this comes from the web or the company that Brian got brought up now called Elastic. Um, they had their first con back in mid-March, and uh, they, they renamed themselves from Elasticsearch to Elastic. Uh, they bought uh, Elasticsearch as a service in the process, um, and they, they threw this awesome conference. So they had a pretty big week where uh, they got a new name, uh, a new acquisition, some new employees, and, um, and, and a, little, a little more money, I'm sure, at some point. But uh, they're a great tool. Anyway, um, Brian, let's take a look at the products list just to kind of um, show the list of what we got here. Um, so from Elastic, uh, kind of going. You're cutting in and out, Matt. 
Um, so um, I'll do my best to not cut in and out. Um, there, you go. So, there we go. So anywho, um, Elasticsearch, uh, El uh, Logstash, and Kibana make up our Elk stack. You can see there's other products here listed as well, Shield, Marvel, and Elasticsearch, Apache, Hadoop, and then um, Language Client. Those are also equally fantastic products. Um, Shield, scroll up a little bit, Brian. Shield is actually related to security around Elasticsearch. Um, Marvel is a fantastic kind of insight, um, a monitoring tool, gives fantastic uh, visualizations of what's going on with your cluster, because as you can imagine, people are, are spinning up thousands of nodes at a time. And then Elasticsearch for Hadoop is fairly self-explanatory. It's um, using Elasticsearch to index data that's, that's in Hadoop. But we're going to focus on the top three. Um, Elasticsearch, to begin, is your indexing tool. Um, Elasticsearch sits on top of Apache Leucine, or I should say it's built around Apache Leucine, um, which is an extremely powerful uh, Java-based index and searching tool. Um, so Elasticsearch uh, wraps a great API around it. Um, well, they, they put a good HTTP API. There's also other API clients as well that they build in. Um, and it just makes the data really, really fun and easy to interact with and work with, and more importantly, get inside the data store. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Logstash is, I consider Logstash the pusher, the worker, if you will. Um, if you need to get something into Elasticsearch, Logstash is going to be one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, it's, it, it has all of the connectors built in. It, it's got an API built in, if you will. It talks to Elasticsearch very, very well. Um, and you can take uh, basically a flat text file of any kind, as well as binary formats too. But you can take a text file or anything of any kind and push it up to Elasticsearch using Logstash. And we'll go over some of the configuration options for that. And then last but not least, there's Kibana. Kibana is um, the open source data viz front end. Um, it's a beautiful Angular JS app. Uh, right now, it's a Node JS app, but there is also just an Angular app as well that we can that we're gonna we're gonna show off. Um, but uh, that lets you interact with your data in a way that that a lot of tools really don't. Um, so, you know, Brian's gonna walk us through a little bit of kind of setting these up and and how to bring all these tools together and stuff. But um, keep in mind too, any questions anyone has, uh, please throw them out there. Please uh, please interrupt us. Please. Um, Please, please ask. We'll be happy to answer. But Brian, why don't you go ahead and take us a little bit through setting this up? Okay, so I'm not sure how how much experience everyone there has with Elasticsearch. If you guys have been using it for months or years or whatever, so I'm going to go through a quick setup. Um, if you use this tool, maybe a little bit boring, but just bear with us, and we'll get to some cool stuff uh, with networks. I think the beauty of the, be the beauty of Brian walking through this setup is that we can do it in about maybe five minutes at the most. Right. Yeah, so, okay, here I'm going to grab Elasticsearch, grab the tar. And then I'm also going to so, grab... So while, Brian, while Brian's pulling all these down, um, we will say, too, there's lots of data and lots of resources out there about, uh, about Elk using, um, bringing all of this stuff together, um, the configuration files and everything. I'll talk a little bit about this further, but, um, yeah, all right, Brian, cool, Cabana. Okay, and then so Kibana 4 is the latest for this uh, presentation. We're, we're going to use 3, so we got to jump on the past releases. And Kibana 3. So this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, Kibana 4 is, uh, is actually a, a node app, um, an, an Angular node app. And it's super powerful, and it does fantastic aggregations. The only thing is it takes, and this is not a fault of anyone, just the way it is. It takes a little bit longer to get up and running, whereas with Kibana 3.1.2, we can actually get into analytics very, very, very fast. So don't think we're using the outdated version or the older version uh, to um, you know, limit the group's exposure, if you will. Um, it's just more of a demonstration and three gets us there quicker. Okay, so here we go. We got um, elapsed. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, could you just uh, pull up that module a little bit? Uh, oh, thank you. Wait, uh, I will. Good? Okay. So I'm going to untar Elasticsearch.
And then uh, Elasticsearch requires uh, Java 7 update. Sorry. Uh, could you bring the screen? Uh, we can't see the bottom line of the terminal. Uh, Okay. You start. You can start at the top. That'd be great. We just gotta clear it. I right, that one still. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So even when it's at the bottom there, you can see it. Free software and then full bar. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And so uh, Elasticsearch depends on Java seven update fifty one, I believe, or Java eight. Uh, let's see. I'm running Java 771, so I'm good. And we can run bin Elasticsearch to get it running. So I just want to comment, Brian, when you pull up Kibana, um, head back to that, sorry, head back to that window real quick, just for everyone who's watching. Um, that's it. Elasticsearch is now running. It's ready to accept data. Um, even better is uh, we're not going to walk too much through like multi cluster configuration and multi node configuration. But if you had changed about two lines on uh, within the config file, you could have done the exact same startup and it would have automatically started um, joining a cluster, becoming either a data or a search node in the cluster and start replicating data immediately as soon as it's discovered inside of there. So they've also built in auto discovery as well inside the tool. So if you're throwing a bunch of different, you know, if you have a massive cluster, you're bringing a bunch together. Um, it's spinning up another instance is very fast. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll just change here just uh, query for local hosts. So you can see that's running right here. And then for Kibana, well, I'll try that. Kibana can run uh, wrapped around Apache or Nginx, but um, you can also install it as a plugin with Elasticsearch, which is kind of nice to around that way. So we'll just make directory um, Elasticsearch. So that, that's how you would install Kibana as a plugin. And we'll go ahead and go back and uh, run Elasticsearch. Sorry, I, I can't hear that. Is the underscore important in the following? Yeah, the, the underscore, that, that's the format that they use. So all the Kibana files are then uh, in this underscore site folder, so it knows to, to serve it up. So we go to local host. And now we're running Kibana as a plugin. So then so I think I wasn't timing it. I wasn't timing it, Brian, but I think that might have been about four <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I was going for the record. Um, and all right, so now we need some data. In here, uh, we're going to go ahead and use bro. Uh, put put some bro logs in here. Um, bro, yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull down bro, um, just to show you guys how, how to integrate it with Elasticsearch. Um, I'm actually not going to do a full compile because it takes quite a while. Uh, I, I have one pre cooked, if you will. So, I'm sorry, bro, CD into it. And then I'll just run a configure so that you see what we're looking for whenever we're compiling bro is this Elasticsearch support. So right now it's false. The library that's required to use uh, bro with Elasticsearch is libcurl and the library for that is in the apt packages is the curl. Thank you.
Okay, so now we'll reconfigure. All right, so now we got a true here for Elasticsearch. We're good to go. We can go ahead and make and make install. Uh, I'm going to step back out of here because uh, the, the, I'm just running this on a VM and uh, I'll take the rest of the presentation to compile it. So the, by default, it lands in user local bro. Go in there and then do an F grep for um, Elastic and everything. So these are the configuration files for bro that have the pattern elastic search in them. Uh, we can check out, so here, let me grab this up. Pro IDS elastic search. First result for this is, is the bro documentation on how to integrate it with elastic search. And it'll have exactly the same thing. I just went over right here. And then we're going to load this to our bro.local bro right here. So I already have it added in. We'll just go there. And then and then we also have here's the uh tuning policy. This would be our configuration right here. So this is the Elasticsearch.bro. Uh, file and you can change your cluster name by default. All of this stuff works out of the box. We're running low post for 9200. Everything looks good. If you want to tune it to your to your instance, you go right ahead. Yeah. So hey, Brian, let me just jump in. Um, okay. So to talk a little bit about kind of how the Elk stack comes together, um, there's a couple of different ways, obviously, that you could get bro logs into Elasticsearch if you wanted to. Um, you could run bro and then output to a typical directory var log or, or the local wherever you wanted to and have log stash monitor that directory if you wanted. Um, and then log stash would capture the logs and push them up or you could have bro automatically output to ES and just specify the IPs and, and, and ports and everything on your local instance. So if you've got bro nodes deployed you know, all over a, an enterprise or whatever it may be. There's a couple different options to to get that data up to ES. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and run bro on this uh, malware traffic analysis packet capture, and we're going to uh, send the data to, to Elasticsearch. So I'm going to cap my bro command I have here. So we're going to run user local bin bro and then take in that PCAP. And then this is the tuning policy that we want to load to run lost Elasticsearch. And then I also add this one just for fun. We wanted our, uh, the, the files, MD5 and SHA-1, so, so we can have that data. So let me go ahead and run that. I got those warnings before, but then I go to Kibana. Right away, we can see we got data in here. We got all of our bro data in here in a, in a bro index. And we can even check back here for all local hosts. Sorry, sorry for the big block of text here. Um, so there's the bro meta index, and then so this is how the bro index will come in. It's from the uh, from the packet capture uh, gets the gets the daytime and names it like that. So now that we have some bro data in there, we're also going to add some Suricata data. And for that, we go ahead and get to the Suricata website. And for this, so whenever, if you have Ubuntu and you just do an install of Suricata from the aptitude package manager, you're going to get 
an older, outdated version. Um, and, and it will not have support for what we're trying to do next is have JSON output for Suricata. So I recommend you, you go ahead to their website, grab this uh, 2.0.7 will work. That's why I'm running. Uh, you can compile it yourself or grab this Ubuntu PPP, PPA, which is a lot easier with a pre-compiled. It has the, the uh, JSON support built into it. So you just grab that, install that PPA, and then you can get running with uh, Suricata. So you say Suricata, and you can see my build info. This is what we're looking for, this uh, libjansom support. So as long as I say says yes, you're good to go. And then to get Suricata working with Elasticsearch, we want this Eve JSON format. And here it gives you a little example of it. And then you need to modify your uh, Suricata configuration file to enable EVLOG. So I keep that in. Okay, so here we go. Here's my config. I have the EVLOG turned on. So we can go ahead and run this. Suricata. Okay, so I have all my output from Bro, and then here's here's my output from Suricata, and here we'll take a look at the. Uh, Eve.json, and this is going to be very easy to throw this into Elasticsearch. That's what we're going to do, just a little bit. So there's there's all the, the information from, and you, you can customize this in the configuration, the files log, the HTTP log, whatever you're looking for. So now to push this up to Elasticsearch, we have, there's an upload JSON. So this is a little script that really simple Ruby script that Matt passed on to me. And uh, all I needed to do was change this. So now it becomes my script. Uh, uh, Matt, what would we call this index? It was like NSM sample. Or NSM. Exercise, NSM exercise. So let me, uh, let me give a quick copy out here too while you pull this together. So first and foremost, the data inside of ES um, in, in Elasticsearch, it sits in JSON already. So the pump is really easy. Um, the reason we did a quick connection to a bulk Matt, HTTP. You're turning on in and out again. Okay, you're good. Is this any, is this any better? Yeah, that's good. Cool. Okay, I was going to say um, the data in Elasticsearch sits in JSON anyways. So having in having data in JSON to push up is really fast and really easy. Um, there's a couple ways. This quick script, I think we wrote it to um, see if we had any errors in lines, which is why it handles the file line by line. Um, but you can also just do a bulk. Um, there's no error handling. I took that part out, but just left in the line parsing. But there is a way um, with uh, Elasticsearch, you can also do a, a RESTful HTTP bulk push as well. It's basically a, a massive curl put command and um, or post command. And you can push it up that way as well. And then you can also use Logstash. So uh, just to kind of cover the breadth of how to get this data back into Elasticsearch, there's multiple avenues, but this one works just fine. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and run that. Ruby. Just run it like this. We'll go back to our Kibana. Okay, so now we have the Suricata log type and all of our data is in here. Okay, so Matt is going to take over from here. He's going to touch a little bit on, uh, on the mapping, the index mapping, and uh, some of the network security monitoring, forensics, and uh, investigation example that we're going to do. Just Go ahead and share out, Matt. Hey, 
Brian, can you see what I'm sharing? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing Cabana and Crown. Hey, cool. I don't know if someone who just joined has got a lot of background noise going on. Uh, but uh, all right, so let's um let's let's back up real quick and uh, let's take a look at um some of our mapping that's in here. So one of the interesting things that Brian Brian talked about was um getting you know getting Bro and Suricata data in Elasticsearch together. Well, obviously, if you've looked at either of these logs before, you know that they're not the same type of log. Um, they don't have the same fields. They don't have the same length. The timestamps aren't even correct either, or they're not, sorry, the same. Um, Suricata is, is, is actually uh, down to, I think, a millisecond, where, um, whereas Bro is actually at an epoch time. So one of, the, uh, one of the things that we'll do ahead to kind of prep our index Instead of just pushing data up to Elasticsearch, uh, we'll actually define our mapping ahead of time. Now, note, there's two different types of fields in here. Um, okay. I've got, uh, let me actually collapse everything. We've got a uh, bro file and Suricata log. Okay. So uh, let me give a blank. Let me give a can make that blanket assumption. Yep, yeah, hang on a sec. How's that? Any better? It's better. Cool. All right. So um, when when building out the mapping for these two, um, again, they're going to be a little bit different, but uh, we can prioritize this in a way that our index is, is going to be a lot smaller. Um, if need be, it's going to handle numbers differently. It's going to handle IPs differently. Um, it's going to give us uh, a, a lot of better way to handle our data. So again, we're doing historical PCAP analysis, but there's no reason you couldn't stream live files if you wanted to. But for the sake of this exercise, um, we're looking at the um, PCAP analysis exercise from uh, malware traffic analysis. And you can see I've got the bro file log. Um, spoiler alert, I know there's some malware in this PCAP, so I want to take a look at the file information. Um, everything here is just input as a string, except for our timestamp. Now note, I kind of did this on purpose to show the difference between the two, um, but this takes all of the different fields from our bro log and pushes them up as strings. If we take a look at an optimized index, where, which is our Suricata logs, now we've got things broken out a little bit better into string, long, um, we've defined some an analyzer for our signature field, and I'll get into just in a couple of minutes what this means. Um, we're handling our IPs a little bit differently, and we've actually got nested JSON documents inside of here, which is really good. So for HTTP, we're looking at host name, method, refer, user agent, so on and so forth. So nesting the JSON lets us handle it a little bit, lets, lets us work with it a little bit more efficiently. Um, and then I think also one of the most important concepts about when pushing data up is that you have to tell um, a visual front end, what field is my timestamp? So you want to make sure your timestamps line up from source to source. So if anyone can think of bro logs off the top of their head, um, the timestamp for bro is actually just TS. Um, for the sake of this, I've changed it on the upload to timestamp, and uh, that's, an, that's an easy configuration tweak, but I've changed that to timestamp. And then for Suricata log, we also have a timestamp as well. So regardless of all the other fields that are there, um, we are going to be doing, you know, luckily our times are going to line up. So, uh, in attempts to mimic the index that Brian was building, um, let's take a look at early Cabana. Uh, can anyone let me know, is this good size? Um, maybe a little bigger. A little bigger. All right. Let's see. How's that? Yeah, good. Cool. All right. So, what we're going to do now... Um, by default, Kibana is going to look for indexes that stem from Logstash, but by no means is that a handicap. So um, what we're going to do is actually tweak this to uh, take a look at our NSM exercise index. Um, we can actually, anything in brackets is static, anything, and then we can also display date value. So we can store this in, in multiple different ways. Our time picker, we're going to take out the app stamp. Uh, the at uh, symbol. So our time field is actually going to be timestamp. And we'll keep it dark just because that's fun. Um, let's go ahead and refresh our page based on our settings. Now, this is your basic come on a dashboard. It looks very boring without any data inside, but luckily we can use our time picker here and we're going to go back 30 days. Notice our histogram here is actually thinking. Um, it's thinking because I've got to give this one the right field as well. 
So we're going to change the field inside of our time picker to actually be timestamp instead of at timestamp. Perfect. Okay. So now time we're starting to see is, some is the log stash uh, format for metadata. Yep. Yeah, exactly. If you push data up via log stash, it's going to be, um, it's going to be pushed. The date is going to be pushed up as at log at, at timestamp. So what we're going to do instead is customize this dashboard. Um, okay, so we know the PCAP was from March 9th, 2015. Our graph shows this, and the beauty of, of kind of being at this state now is we've got Suricata logs and we've got Bro file logs inside of our um, inside of Elasticsearch. We're now going to play around with our data. So without really digging into a log, we're going to investigate and see what happened during the course of this PCAP. Right? We, we're we're interested in, in how this slid apart. So just to get an overview of what's here, we've got a basic query box. Um, we've got our filters for these. These are gonna apply to the entire page. We've got a histogram showing our events over time. Obviously all of our activity is gonna center on March 9th. Now if we wanted to just focus on that day, we could handle this a couple different ways. We could come up here and change our date to just be March 9th. Um, let's actually do the 9th through the 10th, so that way we get a full 24 hours. And now you see we've got a full 24 hours and our activity, uh, the graph is centered a little bit, but we're looking at, at just a day of activity. I actually might have a little bit more. Okay, I go to 6 p.m. on the 10th there. We can adjust that, or we can just drag and, drag and click inside the graph here. All right, so we're getting a little bit closer to our activity. Now remember, this is a PCAP, so we're not looking at a lot of activity. We have a lot happening in a little. All right, perfect. So just looking at our traffic analysis here, I can see that for the first, I don't want to say four minutes of this PCAP, we have, I don't want to say average, but kind of ups and downs with regards to activity. And then the last 45 seconds, absolutely, 30 seconds, absolutely explodes with activity. So in kind of examining what's going on with this, we, we can get an idea that something happened prior to this time, which started throwing all of this up. Um, seeing as we're in Kibana, let's go ahead and drop in um, some filters and see how much is Bro and how much of this is um, Elasticsearch. Oh, sorry, how much is Suricata? I can remember what my, uh, what my type is here. Okay, perfect. So we've got 834 events that are Suricata log type. Um, we can go ahead and color this. We'll color it red. Let's call it Suricata activity. We'll pin this in there and we'll drop a new search in. And what we're going to have now is uh, we're going to start to see some, uh, some red in here as well. Perfect. So our graph is now updated. The yellow is everything, and the red is what what is suricata. So we're going to have some uh, some overlap there. So let's try a different type now. I think it's profiles. I'm not sure why that one's not coming through, but uh, we'll we'll hang tight because I know that we're going to run into the data. Um, anyways, so we've got an aggregate going here. Um, suricata versus overall activity. Uh, as you can expect, we start to see a little bit of Suricata dotted in and out. We can hover over any of these periods of time, and they're going to give us back some statistics that we see there. So 10 events per second with Suricata versus 21 aggregate. Um, what we get here, we're looking at uh, 182 events of Suricata versus 367 aggregate. So we can start to profile what's in there. Now, the other thing I know from Suricata is that we've got uh, an, alert, um, an alert trigger as well. So we can look at this a couple different ways. Um, we can hit focus on our alert signature, which is going to show us a list of the alerts that are within the current view that we're looking at, or we can actually drop in a graph and profile these. So again, because it's a fully customizable AngularJS, we're going to move our histogram over a little bit, and I apologize, the resolution is probably going to throw this off. But that's okay. What we're going to do is add in a terms panel, and we're going to call this alerts. Um, our field is actually going to be alert.signature. So uh, I won't go through all the fields, but we basically want to display a pie graph, because pie graphs are cool and fun, of all of the alerts that we're seeing throughout, this, uh, throughout the traffic right now. 
All right, so this pie graph is completely thrown off by the resolution and looks actually quite ugly. So what I'm gonna do instead is actually just change it to a um, table. And it should give us our top 10 alerts that we're seeing. Okay, I'm gonna zoom back out just for the sake of showing it and then I'll zoom back in for the demo. Um, but you can see what we've done now is now we generate an alert table of what types of alerts are we seeing inside of our traffic. Um, we can look at it another way as well. We can come back down here to alert signature and say, hey, Elasticsearch or Kibana, show me only events with alerts in them. We can hone in on this little magnifying glass here. So now we've got 58 events, um, 58 Suricata and 58 aggregate, which means we're one for one. So that's, that's a good thing. We're now looking at all Suricata events and, and all of the alerts that came through. And then this table down here is also dynamic. So we can actually start to build this out as well. Um, so I wanna look at timestamp. Uh, let's take a look at source IP, destination IP, and then I'm gonna alert, look at alert signature as well. Um, the table's dynamic and it's sortable, so we can actually sort by time. So now um, starting at 454, the, the very beginning of this PCAP, and it looks like we have a, uh, a, a nuclear exploit kit landing. Um, this is using uh, the emerging threat library for Suricata, but uh, chronologically, we can start to see exactly where our, what exploit hit us first, right? And if we just scroll down through alerts, we've got nuclear, it looks like there's a, a it looks like it's tried or we've tripped alerts on flash, on an outdated IE, on Silverlight. Um, we get down to double server headers and then boom, we've got a, a Keely host infection and we've got a Simda C check-in. So I like seeing check-in events. So it's starting to, we're starting to get C2 communication. And if we keep scrolling down, the alerts just continue, continue, continue. Um, so immediately within our PCAP, we sorted by time and we found a nice little starting point. Let's, um, let's blow back all of the alerts because we now know what we're looking for. We know our first alert was a nuclear exploit kit. And then if we blow that back, it's gonna affect all of our other elements. So we can search by time and boom, we can get back to our, um, our nuclear exploit kit. We can now take a look and see what's happened afterwards. Um, so as you would expect, we've got a little bit of traffic kind of in between these events here. And I only know this because of the timestamp wise, but here's a bro file log that is uh, in, sitting in between some of these Suricata events. We've also got a hash associated with it as well. Um, and I'm liking, I'm, I like to see file activity when I see alerts dropped in. So again, we have a dynamic table. Um, let's go ahead and bring in some of the uh, some, some of the content that we're seeing here. Um, so HTTP URL we can drop in, and let's see if we also want to bring in. So we're going to bring in um, bro information. We'll bring in our MIME type and then an MD5 hash. Now this is going to be thrown off the screen because of uh, because of the resolution that we're looking at. But focusing on the alert signature, we can scroll down. Okay, so we have our starting point. We have our nuclear exploit landing kit, and then boom, we've got immediately we've got a page request. Um, we've got a refer, the fortinet.biz, and then the host name that it's referring to is a .vu. If I'm sitting and examining this p-track for suspicious traffic, I'm, I'm immediately throwing, throwing an alert up. I'm a little, a little nervous about what I'm seeing. And we've also got a non-human named HTML page as well. Um, so that's just one line after the packet. So we can continue scrolling down and it looks like we've got a bro finding here. We've got a hash that we could bump up against uh, a source. We could look through our system. We can compare it against the files that bro pulls out. Um, and then continuing to scrolling down, we've got a bunch of other obfuscated strings that we're seeing being referred to from our bad domain, and then strings that just come flying out of nowhere. Um, obviously, see, obfuscated. Uh, Matt, go back there. You see what's delivering as well in the, the mind type? When, when have you yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah, so right here, uh, let me see. So right it's a blank it. MIME type. What's up? The one above it? Yeah, that one. Perfect. Hey, good point, Brian. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I completely skipped over it. Um, you're right. No, take a look at our content type, an application octet stream being pulled down from this link, um, which, uh, you know, is, is going to throw up another flag for me, um, is, is going to put another another pin that I need to investigate a little bit further. Right. So we are seeing nuclear payload. Event. Yep, exactly. So let's see if we have one 
here. Okay, so these are our, our text HTMLs. And the beauty of all this, and again, if the focus here is to think about Elasticsearch as an analysis tool, if there's something that we want to see, right, let's go back here. Our HTTP content type, that seems to be a really important field. So let's actually back up. Let's take out MIME type and MD5, because in this resolution, they aren't doing much for us. And let's drop in HTTP content type and see if this gives us a little bit more, more direction, if you will, a little bit more context. So again, our first alert, drops we've got multiple html files hit boom a whole string of application octet streams interlaced with bro files in between as well so another nice way to look at our data um, we can continue scrolling down and again there are some flags you can throw here but we've got bro files uh, throwing some hashes at us which we could look up a little bit further um, continuing down we've got more obfuscated strings wrapped around with suricata alerts um, so, you know, for a five minute setup, a 30 second log push, and then maybe a two minute dashboard build, we've already started to profile very quickly what's going on inside of this PCAP and, and what kind of data that we're seeing. Um, again, interlaced with bro logs, we're getting information about our files being downloaded. We're getting MD5 hashes to come out of them. Um, we're getting file sizes as well coming out of this data. So it's a long, long, long laundry list of what we can quickly pull out of there. Um, now, again, I understand walking everyone through a PCAP sounds fairly simple, but the other side of it is let's get some quick answers to our data that we're seeing. Um, so, for example, let's, uh, let's see, let, let's go back and take a look. We saw something, um, we saw a beaconing, if you will. We saw a check-in event. So let's see if we've got any other events for alert signature containing check-in. And I'm going to actually disable this so we get the red out of the way. And it looks like we've got five events giving a check-in, three SIMDAs and two Kelios. Organized by time, um, we can see SIMDAs checking in before Kelios, but immediately we've got, uh, it looks like maybe close to 45 to 45 seconds to a minute in between SIMDA, and we've got 22 seconds in between Kelios checking in. So we can immediately start to profile that type of traffic as well. Um, the beauty of Elasticsearch is, again, it stores everything in JSON. So every row that you see actually is an interactive clickable event. So we can scroll down and take a look at this Trojan, uh, sorry, at this um, Trojan alert from Suricata, and we see a signature ID, we see an IP, ports. So that gives us a little bit more information to look out for. And then again, we know the time frame that we're looking for, right? So let's use this as another pivot point. Let's take a look at this last check-in event. Let's hone in on that one. And let's remove this. So what else was going on around this time? All right, we've got a couple server headers being in there, um, a few more alerts being thrown. We're seeing a few more IPs. Um, let's see. And a little bit more, um, we got some more hashes from Bro coming in there. Um, we've got just, just a lot more data. So without belaboring the point, I think uh, the goal is to just show how easy and quick it is to bring a lot of different types of logs together. And when you overlay them, um, you can look at a PCAP for five minutes. And if it's an obvious thing, if the alerts are sticking out, there's a real quick win on identifying kind of what's there, um, what, you know, what shouldn't be there or, or what's sticking out, that kind of stuff. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a neat tool, I think, a good way um, to bring all this to the front. The chat, if, if you got time to address that. Yeah, sure. Definitely. I, I, I mean, John, this is, I'm not sure how hard of a cutoff it is. I've got time if there's any other questions, but um, uh, sure. Can, can you pull up the chat from? Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no rush. Um, so D-Web said, um, why wouldn't you just use Squeal? then you don't have to pivot to two to three apps. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, th there's lots of other tools, I guess, to visualize this and look at it, um, to look at this type of data. I think it depends on the infrastructure that you have and also the type of data that you're looking for. So from a kind of historical analysis point of view, and, and D-Web, if this doesn't answer the question, let me know. From a historical analysis point of view, um, a single PCAP is not that much data. And there is probably tools to look at it a different way. Um, some of the implementations I've done with Elasticsearch, which quite frankly would have been too slow, or um, I couldn't replicate in time for, for this, this talk, if you will. 
are bringing um, months and months, years and years of historical data together. Um, we're kicking off massive kind of imports of historical logs. And the beauty of the reason, not the beauty, but the reason why we use Elasticsearch is it indexes everything and it lets us search historically across a lot of data. Um, so again, I guess to reiterate, for the point of this exercise, a single PCAP could certainly be examined a, a bunch of different ways. Um, there's no doubt about it. But I've, I've walked into the door and seen, you know, a terabyte of bro logs from someone who basically flipped the on switch and then never, ever bothered to look at anything. Um, oh, sorry, I see a follow up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, would, I would say that, that you're right on the money. Um, real time event flow, uh, it, it does that very well as well. Um, I, I wouldn't want to take away from that. It, it is able to handle logs real time, um, and you can obviously play with them in a different way. But if you're looking to solely kind of hone in on alerts and then go to something else, or then, then there are definitely other tools to do that. Um, I hope that answered it, but uh, if not, let me know. I just also wanted to add, I mean, one of the things that we really like about it is the customized, customizability and the performance of it because, like, a lot of the things that we run into aren't a nice structured PCAP or whatever. We run into a lot of different log types of the clients and stuff like that, and we custom build our tools to that. And And then also the performance of, you know, some of the data that we're handed is outrageous that you can, you know, help us. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I, think, I think that's a great answer, the web that you just put up there. Um, <laughs> but let me, uh, let, let, let me bring up another point as well. Um, using Logstash, so this is actually the, the, the way, Logstash, very simple concept. Input is what's coming in. Um, filters are what am I doing with it, and output is where you're going to push it. Um, so, the input and file filter and output is, is a pretty powerful con, uh, combination, but the codex also allow us to handle different types of data as well. You can actually take historical net flow and throw it at Logstash and it eats it like it's no problem and then brings it up into Elasticsearch for you. So there's more than just PCAPs, I think. Um, there's, there's multiple different ways to, to handle a lot of different types of data. And again, if it is sitting in something like, you know, if it's just a plain text file or you've got, you know, gigs and gigs and gigs of logs that no one's ever looked at before, um, here's a quick and fast way to start to get a handle on that. I guess um, with that, though, um, group, that's, uh, you know, that, that brings us to time. So um, I'm not, not going to rush. I could, I could talk all day, but I understand if anyone's sensitive to that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it, this was just a real quick kind of walkthrough of, of a single PCAP historical analysis with the, with Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, there's a lot more avenues we could take this down. Um, we, you know, lo love to explore some of those other options. If anyone has any other questions they didn't want to bring up in the chat or whatever, feel free to let us know. Um, but, uh, with that, you know, on behalf of Brian and myself, John, thanks, thanks a lot. I, I appreciate you having us on here. I, I wish we had uh, a, a day or two to kind of go over you know, handling those gigs and terabytes of logs and everything like that. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so do you know what other types of data you can actually import into Elasticsearch uh, without like using JSON or using a log stash and to pick up files in the directory? Is there any way for other uh, things that are going to be used for importing data? Sorry, re repeat, repeat that one more time. I'm sorry, it, it got a little got a little muffled on the end. Or Brian, if you can answer it. Yeah, I'm just curious about uh, more supported ways of importing data into Elasticsearch. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You know, besides the JSON or yeah. Yep. So, um, really, if you can. Uh, if you can, if you can, so there's APIs for Ruby, for Python, for .NET, for Java, for, I mean, you name it, there's APIs out there. There's also rivers that can hook into other data sources as well. Um, quite frankly, if you can parse it and get it into some form of text, you can push it up into Elasticsearch. We've actually had some instances too where we've taken just some super, super dirty log formats with very inconsistent field types and written kind of uh, intelligence, the wrong word, but scripts with a lot of if statements inside of them that um, can, 
to, to, can can structure themselves based on that, and then we build it. We've built the JSON by hand as well. So um, if you can get it into like a string or a text format with a script or an API, or sorry, with a script, then you can push it up. There's APIs all over the place. Okay, cool. Well, by the way, so if anybody is remote and you would like to ask a question, you guys can unmute yourself and you can ask the question and then mute yourself again. Do we have any uh, questions from those that are remote? So uh, whenever you deploy these, uh, Matt and Brian, like, what, do you typically do these in the single instance where you have, like, I don't know, I don't know what the where 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 good measurement is, but between like hundreds of thousands or millions of events where you would probably want to use a cluster. Yeah, so I've um, I, I'll, I'll take this one first, Brian. I've um, I've I've personally uh, I've personally put out um, uh, I want to think I'm thinking right now. This is going to sound horrible to everyone on this call, but I've been in an environment where there were 87 ingress egress points. I know it's a, it was a nightmare. Um, but uh, so I've deployed an 87 node monitoring cluster um, where we had 87 instances of Logstash running. And um, from Logstash running, we were pushing up to like a five cluster or a five node Elasticsearch cluster. Um, so it, it was a pretty, pretty big one. Um, this is we were talking about a lot of traffic coming through. We had uh, we had bro running on all of them, so we were bringing in bro logs and basically with with Kibana getting an enterprise snapshot of traffic at that point in time. And I think um, this was this was the last development stage. I remember. I think we had about ten instances of Snort deployed as well, based on where they were sitting relative to the to the company. Um, and we were actually bringing in the Snort logs. As well, so we were um, again overlaying everything. That that was a that was a massive cluster. That was you you could you Kibana actually has a auto refresh on it. Um, you you could set the auto refresh and the screen would never stop scrolling. Brian, you got any you got any war stories for us? Any questions for us? No, not, not not anything that compares to that, man. <laughs> just, just that one. Whenever we're trying to, uh, um, I don't know. You, your what was your record of, of putting in a million million lines? Yeah, that's that's the other thing too. Is um, <laughs> we um for for like massive scaled historical analysis um. It works out really well. So we've uh, I've, I've used I've used ES as well to um, take a look. Like I said, I've walked into a place before where there's a terabyte of logs just hanging out, and someone's like, "Yeah, I have no way of looking at those." Or as usual, insert commercial sim here was not configured correctly, so it's not looking up. You know, it's not looking at logs the way they want it to look. Um, but in any event, um, I walked into some uh, some instances and 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 pushed up. You know, you write a script that recurses through and pushes up and you can push about a million um, rows, for lack of a better term. I've got about a million rows in 40 seconds. So um, it just chomps through data very, very fast. Oh, nice. All right, we just got a cool, uh, we just got another question in. Do we have time, John, to keep answering questions? Cool, all right. Um, have we done translations in Logstash with threat feed data? Um, Yes. So kind of another hidden feature. And again, I, I apologize if it looks like we should have showed more, but there's um, definitely, there's, there's a lot that can be done with Logstash where um, you can actually drop in dictionaries, if you will. Oh, okay. Boom. Uh, Meh, Meh's iPhone, who is uh, contributing to this as I'm talking, um, is uh, you can drop in dictionaries on Logstash, which is, which are basically lookups. Um, so you, that's one way to do things. I guess enriching data in Elasticsearch is another another really cool feature as well. Um, I've used Logstash dictionaries where you can. I've actually, you know what? If you want, I can show you um, some Bro Logstash dictionaries, which um, which work out pretty well. So like the Bro Con Log, for example, here. Um, zoom in. 
So the bro, so if anyone looked at bro logs, um, you know that the, uh, let me see, I'm trying to remember what, what event this is, but something in the bro con log actually has um, connection statistics. So with Logstash, if you wanted to grab a little bit more data or if you didn't have these memorized, you could build out a dictionary, a translate dictionary, and tell Logstash that when it's importing your data, give me this information as well. So tell me that an S0 is connection attempt seen, no reply. Tell me that a, you know, an SH is originator sent a sin followed by a fin, but we never saw synax, so on and so forth. So the dictionaries really, really, really let you help out. Um, really help you build out uh, some more power. The other thing you can do as well is you can enrich your data on the ingest as well. And, and I'm going to use enrich kind of very lightly. Um, but uh, John, you were asking earlier about some APIs and some scripts and everything. If you'd imagine what you can do with a script and an API, you know, it, it, at any point with any piece of data, um, you can do the same and then push it up to Elasticsearch. So one of the, uh, one of the things that I've done before and again, this was more of a proof of concept. It was by no means a network security monitoring methodology, and I would not recommend this to anyone as a, as a flag, if you will. But every time a bro file log dumped a hash, we'd bump the hash up against virus total and, and malware and all that kind of stuff and, and get back to see if any data, like did we have any super low hanging fruit in front of us? Um, did we have anything that just you know threw off the Richter scale of AV alerts and that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a couple ways to take a little piece of data and not just look at it in a visual form, if you will, but also, you know, use my API script and bump it up against a few bunch of, bunch of different sources and then throw all that into Elasticsearch. And then instead of filtering on, you know, um, instead of filtering on alert signatures, for example, filter on, uh, hey, uh, show me everything in virus total from the, you know, with a successful hit in the past five minutes. So a um, bunch of different ways to interpret and look at your data as well. Do we have any more questions before we end our hearing? Okay, well, uh, I want to thank uh, Brian and Matt for donating their time to talk about talk today. I think it was a really cool, I definitely like the immediate visualization. So I'm sure we'll have uh, a our lab up and running. We'll actually yeah, you know, have a chance to experience and get some practical hands on experience. Uh, experience. So uh, thank you guys for coming, and we're a little over time, but we're going to go ahead and conclude. Um, Next week, we will have, uh, I believe, Justin Azoff will be talking about his uh, stats D and bro integration with uh, Intel CB and Grafana. So I do look forward to that. And this video will be uh, available online, YouTube, and Vimeo. Uh, take care, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.